here. Um, this is going to be my video presentation for chapter 37, um, which is uh, basically on the structure and function of neurons in your nervous system. Um, just fair warning, this one might be a little bit lengthy. There's a lot of really, really important stuff in this chapter that we need to talk about. Um, but at the end, we might we might do a little or do a couple drugs. So, you know, watch till the end. Okay, so, and again, you have this these presentations on my website, so we're going to go through the slides pretty quickly. Um, if you want to review something, either watch the video again or look at the PowerPoint uh, on your own time. Okay, so neurons. Neurons are what you call nerve cells. Uh, it's one of the communication systems of your body, along with the endocrine system. Um, the nervous system is, remember, the sort of faster moving system. The endocrine system is slower, even though it's not especially slow. It just the signals last longer. Um, so neurons, um, if you look at the structure of a neuron, um, and I realize my face is covering part of the neuron. Um, so they come in all shapes and sizes, but the general sort of scheme is that you have these structures called dendrites. And dendrites receive signals from the, you know, there'd be another neuron right here from the uh, previous neuron. The cell body is part of the nerve cell that has all the organelles, the nucleus, the mitochondria, all the things it needs to, to function. The axon hillock is this sort of like cone-shaped structure that comes off the cell body. And the axon is sort of like a long, thin wire. Um, the analogy is, is an electrical cord, um, which sends a signal down. And down here would be a second neuron. Um, and if you notice up close, the two neurons don't actually touch. Let me actually, here's a bigger picture of this. Um, so here's the first neuron, here's the second neuron. They don't actually touch. The space between them is called the synaptic or the synapse. Um, the end is called the synaptic terminal. And the way the signal goes from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic neuron is through chemicals called neurotransmitters. Um, we'll talk about those more later, but the two neurons don't actually touch. Um, Synapse neurotransmitters, glial cells, we don't really need to get into. Those are, are supporting cells that, that either protect the neuron or help nourish the neuron. Um, they don't actually send signals themselves. Um, so the way the nervous system works, you know, in a nutshell. Um, so let's just do an example. So let's say someone shines a flashlight in your eyes and you sort of flinch. So there's sensory input, there's integration, and there's motor output. Sensory input would be the signal being detected by some kind of neuron. In this case, it would be in your eyes. Um, the signal then gets sent to either the brain or, in some cases, the spinal column. And the signal gets integrated, which means the body decides, like, what, what is this? Is this dangerous? Is this important? What should I do? And the motor output goes to what's called a motor neuron or an effector cell, which carries out the body's response. So in the case of a flashlight in your eyes, the response would be that you flinch. Um, so you have neurons that detect stimuli, which go to the brain or spinal column. Then you have neurons that integrate the signal. Then you have neurons um, that are called effector, or I'm sorry, they're called motor neurons that send a signal to usually a muscle that tell the body what to do about it, uh, which we just talked about. Um, sensory neurons, inner neurons, and motor neurons. Sensory receive, inner neurons integrate or process, and motor neurons send the signal to whatever. Um, again, usually muscle, although it could be a, a gland, it could be a, uh, an endocrine gland, um, to tell the body what to do. Okay, and like I say, they come in all shapes and sizes. This is just sort of the general, um, actually this, this is an exception. The ones, this is a general neuron, something like this. These are just different, different um, examples of, the, of, of neurons. Okay, so. The real gist of this chapter is the, the concept of what's called um, an action potential. So the way that neurons work is they are, basically they're charged. Um, the inside of the neuron, the cytoplasm, um, compared to the outside is negatively charged. And that's called a membrane potential because it's, you know, the charge difference is across the membrane. Um, the inside a resting neuron has a resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. That's a number I want you to memorize, negative 70 millivolts. Um, so the inside is negative compared to the outside. And what happens here is that, you know, changing the membrane potential, changing the charge is a kind of signal. Um, if the resting potential changes 
and it becomes more positive, that's that's like if someone shocks you. That's that's a signal, and the body uses these electrical signals to send messages down down a neuron. Um, one thing that's sort of odd to think about is, you know, the inside is negatively charged, but there are no negative charges. Um, the two ions that we're talking about are sodium and potassium. Um, sodium is Na+, potassium is K+, they're both positive. So if they're both positive, how can the inside be negative? Well, there's more positive on the outside, which means in comparison, the inside is negatively charged. Although, again, nothing is actually, like, there are no you know, negative charges flying around, it's all positive charges, just a comparison of where do you have more positive charges. We'll come back to that more in a minute. So these graphs are super important. So this first graph, there's a neuron um, at rest at negative 70 millivolts. A resting neuron is polarized, which just means there's some kind of uneven distribution of charge, all right? Um, the analogy is if you take a spring and coil it, like grab the coils together, um, if you let it go, it's going to uncoil. So grabbing the coils together is is polarizing that spring. To hyperpolarize means to make it even more charged. So if I made the resting potential negative 80 millivolts, you've hyperpolarized it. Depolarization means you've made it less negative. So if I made the resting potential negative 60 millivolts, you've depolarized it. Now notice what happens here. All right, this is called an action potential. Here I've I've shifted the resting potential to negative 55 millivolts. And negative 55 millivolts is a very important number. I want you to memorize that one too. That's the threshold. If you get to negative 55, um, it just goes crazy. You get what's called an action potential, and the neuron depolarizes in a big way. It becomes positively charged on the inside, um, which we call an action potential. Once you get to negative 55, you, you don't have half of this. You either have it or you don't. So hyperpolarization means you, you definitely are not going to have it. You've made it more negative. Depolarization means you're getting there. And if you get to negative 55, you have an action potential, um, which is a neuron. You know, we use the term that the neuron fires. Um, there's no actual firing. It's just the electrical signal goes down the length of the neuron. Okay. So how do I how do I form these charges? So um, a resting neuron, again, negative 70 on the inside. So you've heard of the sodium-potassium pump, the salty banana. Um, it's a, a transport protein in the membrane of, of, in this case, nerve cells, neurons, that transport sodium um, outside and potassium inside. And if you look at the way the, the protein, if you look at this, like sodium is circles, potassium are the little pyramid or little squares on their sides. Um, diamond, I guess, is a better word for it. So there's three spots for sodium and two spots for potassium. So when this thing opens out, three sodiums come out. When it opens in, two potassiums come in. So for one, like, open and close, that's one reason why it's more positive on the outside, because more sodium comes out than potassium comes in. And, of course, this is active transport. This takes ATP, so polarizing the neuron takes energy. Um, again, if you coil a spring, that took energy. Releasing it did not take energy. Coiling it does. So getting the neuron charged, getting it primed, takes ATP. Okay, it's just waiting for a signal to fire. Um, this is the same picture, just bigger. Um, notice you have the salty banana, you have the sodium potassium pump. You also have, down the length of the, of the axon, or actually here we're looking at dendrites, but the same thing happens in the axon. You have different protein transport or transport proteins um, where potassium and sodium can come in and out. You have this one, for example, would be for potassium. This one's for sodium. And they open and close sequentially. And the deal is this, this is just facilitated diffusion. Like if sodium potassium comes in or out, it's just based upon the concentration gradient. So like right now, it looks like potassium wants to leave the cell due to diffusion. But if the transport proteins are closed, it can't. But if they open, they do. Um, and basically what happens, once you reach the threshold, negative 55 millivolts, these transport proteins open and close sequentially going down the neuron. Um, and, the, you know, the sort of temporary pos positivity of the neuron moves down the axon because these open and close sort of in concert. Okay, this just shows the relative concentrations. You can look at this yourself. Um, so long story short, let, let's just get to... 
let's actually get to this this picture that shows what's going on. I'm, I'm no, I'm skipping this, but this picture shows what's going on in the whole whole process. So we're at rest, all right. Once the neuron starts to de so that that's stage one. Once the neuron starts to depolarize, um, so depolarize means you're becoming more positive on the inside. During stage two, potassium channels open, so potassium can come inside. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Sodium channels open. Erase that. Sodium channels open. The little circles are sodium. Sodium is on the outside initially. Potassium is on the inside initially. If the sodium channel is open, sodium comes in, which makes the inside more positively charged, and so you're depolarizing. Notice the potassium channels are closed. All right. Once you hit negative 55, the sodium channel is open in a big way. Lots of sodium comes in. You get this peak in positivity, which is what this slide calls the rising phase. That's three. So look at four. So in four, we have the opposite. We're going to close the sodium channels, and we're going to open the potassium channels. Um, so potassium diffuses out, which means the inside is losing positivity, so it becomes more negative. So that's stage four here, the falling phase. Stage five, the undershoot, uh, basically the cell, you know, you want to get back to negative 70. It kind of goes too far. Um, during this undershoot, you have a ton of potassium um, leaving the cell. And during this undershoot, it's called the refractory period. During this period, the neuron cannot fire again. Like it's immune to firing. It's It's been um, turned off for, it's like one or two milliseconds. It's a very, very, very short period of time. And now you're back at rest. So, you know, all these slides that I skipped are basically going through what I just said um, on, on this diagram. So, you know, if you compare here, to here, the two ones, you're back at the beginning, but now your ions are on the wrong side. You know, at rest, potassium is in, sodium is out. All right. And at the end here, you've switched it. So now you need to get it back to the way it was. And you do that with the sodium potassium pump. Um, the salty banana sort of re reprimes the, um, the neuron um, to where you're back at negative 70. Um, and that takes energy. So firing really didn't take any energy of in the neuron that's it's firing right now. Obviously, it had to be turned on from the previous neuron. Um, priming the neuron takes energy. Firing really doesn't, which kind of makes sense. You want the neuron ready to go before you need it. Okay. Anything else to talk about with this slide? I think we've I think we've handled it. Okay. Cool. So action potential. This graph is super important. Um, you should understand all the phases of it really, really well. Okay, we discussed the refractory period. Um, we've discussed all this. So here, so yeah, so if you look at the axon, the, the action potential starts here, and you can see it moves down the axon to the um, synapse. That's, that's the axon. The, the action potential starts here, and you can see it moves down the axon to the um, synapse. That's, that's the nerve signal, okay? All right, um, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm not going to worry about that. So, okay, here's the next part of the story. So, you know, your nervous system conducts what sort are of called the electrochemical signals. They're electrochemical signals. The electro part is what we just talked about, all right? The chemical part is this next part. So, because neurons don't actually touch each other, Getting the signal from one neuron, from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron, is a different kind of signal. Um, it's a chemical signal, and a chemical is called neurotransmitters. And basically, so here's my presynaptic neuron, here's my postsynaptic neuron, and at the end of the presynaptic neuron, you have little vesicles containing chemicals called neurotransmitters. And basically, when the signal gets to the end, the little vesicles fuse, so you have exocytosis, and they bind to what are called ligand-gated ion channels. They're just um, receptors in the postsynaptic neuron, and when that happens, the postsynaptic neuron fires. Um, if these neurotransmitters were always in the synapse, the neuron would always be firing, which is, you know, usually not what you want. You want to be able to do the signal, then you want to be able to turn the signal off. So basically, these are either going to be um, 
broken down in the synapse or the presynaptic neuron will sort of take them back up again. Um, it depends. And when that happens, um, the communication between the two nerves stops. Okay. Um, we talked about that. So neurons can be inhibited or they can be excited. So say, say this neuron sends a signal to turn this neuron off. That would be an inhibitory signal. So that might hyperpolarize the, the postsynaptic neuron. So say, you know, you're at negative 70. If the signal made it negative 75, if it was a negative 5 millivolt signal, then it would inhibit the neuron after it, which sometimes you want to do that. Um, if this neuron, if the pre one is going to turn this neuron on, it's going to be an, an exit, hmm, a neuron that excites, I, right now I can't pronounce this word, um, a signal that excites the neuron, um, excitatory, 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 that's how you said it, an, an excitatory neuron. You, know, you can delete the last 10 seconds of your memory. Um, that might be a signal that takes the synapse or the, not synapse, the postsynaptic neuron from negative 70 to negative 65. Um, so EPSPs make the resting potential less negative. IPSPs make the resting potential more negative. Okay. Um, we discussed how neurotransmitters can be repackaged and, and taken back up by the presynaptic neuron. Um, this is a great picture. So this is one, the big neuron is the postsynaptic neuron, and it's connected to a whole bunch of presynaptic neurons. Um, I mean, there's dozens of them, and some of them might be ones that excite, some might be ones that inhibit. So like that neuron could be receiving different signals from the brain, and overall it's what is the overall cumulative effect on the resting potential of the postsynaptic neuron. If it gets negative 55, it's going to fire. Uh, so this just shows here I had two um, excitatory signals. They weren't, they didn't overlap, so nothing happened. Here I had two, they um, they overlapped enough to where I got an action potential. Here I had two, they overlapped at the, you know, at the same time. One excited, one inhibited, then I had two combined. You know, the long story short, so if you get to negative 55, it's going to fire. Um, neurotransmitters, there's a bunch of them. Um, one of the most common ones is called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine um, is one that's used in, in I mean, your body uses it, invertebrates use it, it's really common. Um, it's so common that it's lots of, like, you've probably heard of sarin gas, um, like World War I, World War II era nerve agents. These are um, neurotoxins that block acetylcholine. And if you block acetylcholine, your nerves can't communicate and you, you die, like you're, you die. Um, your nervous system needs to work. Um, GABA is another one that's super important. Um, dopamine, we're going to come back to dopamine in a minute. Serotonin is an important one. Um, serotonin helps balance your mood. Um, yeah. Okay, so we talked about this. Okay, so. Um, let's actually just really quick go back to serotonin. Serotonin, um, quick aside on pharmacology. So anti-anxiety medications like Prozac or Zoloft, the way those work, those are called SSRIs. And SSRI stands for oh, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. And what those medications do is they, if you inhibit the reuptake of serotonin, then that serotonin sort of lingers in the synapse for longer. Um, and what those medications do, they're anti-anxiety, they're the sort of mood stabilizers. So the idea here is if you reuptake the serotonin too, too quickly, that's, that's not what you want to have happen. That's a problem with your brain chemistry. So SSRIs, anti-anxiety medications, you know, prevent the serotonin from being reuptaken as quickly so it helps stabilize your mood. Um, so, okay, so let's do some drugs. I promised we would do some drugs. So let's just do a really quick lesson on opioids um, and what what is addiction and what they do. So opioid medications like heroin, like morphine, um, they mess with your brain's chemistry. And sometimes you might want to do that. This, this particular picture 
is a neuron for pain. So my presynaptic neuron, you know, you have neurons whose only job is to detect pain, which is the brain's way of saying, you know, whatever you're doing, stop doing because that hurts. So in this picture, um, the signal is coming, the neurotransmitter is these little blue triangles. And when this, when the neurotransmitter binds to the postsynaptic neuron, the, the signal for pain goes wherever it's going to go. So heroin or morphine, really any opioid, um, they compete with the receptor or they compete for the receptor binding site with the pain neurotransmitter and they block it. So basically the idea here is, you know, the pain is still there. You know, if you're, if you're having surgery and they've given you morphine or whatever uh, medicine to, where you don't feel the pain, the, you know, the, the pain's still there, just the signal doesn't go to the brain. So you don't, you don't process the signal. Um, and that's what opioids do. They, they block pain. Once the opioid wears off, the pain is still there. You just, you can't process the pain. Um, you know, a medication like Advil makes your headache go away. It's an anti-inflammatory. Advil actually like makes the problem go away. Um, opioids don't, they just mask whatever's going on. Now the problem with withdrawal is that your body I mean, again, we're talking about your brain, and your brain is super duper complicated. But your your think of it like your body is always trying to define normal. Um, it's always looking for homeostasis. And like in this picture, there's there's six receptors, right? Three of them, or four of them, have heroin bound. So, you know, normal is you feel pain. So if you're on heroin and you're very very you know, if you're not, if you don't feel any pain, your body thinks that's normal. So it can change the number of receptors here. And basically, if you're numbing all pain, your body thinks that's normal. So I need to become way more sensitive to pain. So, you know, you make, you change the number of receptors. And if you aren't on the opioids, you're super sensitive to pain. So like everything hurts. So like you're, you, know, you feel like your skin's on fire. You, 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 your eyes hurt, so you gorge your eyes out of your out of your eye sockets. You know the weight of your clothes hurts. You've seen, you've probably seen pictures on billboards of people who are on meth, and they don't they don't look well um, because they you know you just you're oversensitized to everything, so everything hurts. Um, and withdrawal would be the the time for your body to restore your brain chemistry to where you have the appropriate number of receptors um, to what is normal. And there's a there's a sort of famous expression with, with drug addicts called chasing the first high. And what that means is that the first time you use heroin or whatever, um, you know, you get high, you feel really good, but then your body adjusts. So to get back to that same level of euphoria, you have to take more of the drug, right? And when you're an addict, you're basically taking a lot of the drug not to get high, but to feel normal. Because when you aren't on the drug, you, you feel terrible. So you're, you know, you're addicted and you're taking the medicine not because you want to get high, but because you just want to feel normal again. So it's the idea of chasing the first high. Um, that's how, that's what opioids do. Um, opioids also mess with what's called the reward center of your brain. So dopamine is another neurotransmitter that's involved in the pleasure centers of your brain. And basically, to, to simplify this, you know, your, your brain, these pathways are activated when you eat, um, sex activates them, um, the runner's high, which I've never experienced, um, but your brain wants to reward you for doing, doing those things. So the dopamine pathways are pathways of your brain that make you feel good, right? Um, lots of opioid drugs interact with this reward pathway to make you, you know, if you look at this first picture, this is, you know, your body wants to reward you for eating because eating keeps you alive. Um, the body rewards you for sex because sex propagates the species. So like this is, this is a normal thing. You see, the do, uh, sorry, dopamine is the neurotransmitter. Um, cocaine, another opioid, you know, mimics dopamine so that the, the synapse is always filled. So you always feel super high. You feel great. You feel euphoria all the time. The problem is when you stop taking it, you know, now, now you need this much to feel normal. And so you're in, you're in withdrawal. 
So, you know, drugs, these opioid drugs, which we could talk for hours about the opioid academic, epidemic in the country, but, you know, they're messing with your brain chemistry. And that's what addiction is, because your brain's going to adapt to whatever it, its face is, because it's trying to define what is normal. You know, you know, having dopamine after a meal, your body produces that normally. Taking it as a drug, it does not produce that normally. Um, so that leads to, to withdrawal. Um, one also quick little note on um, Narcan. You've probably heard of Narcan. Narcan is the anti-overdose drug. Um, Naloxone's the actual name. Narcan is the brand name. Um, and the way that Narcan works, because, you know, people who overdose on, opio on opioids, their heart stops and they die. Um, Narcan, so if you look at the picture, Narcan are the, the opioid is the purple circle and the receptors are these green, whatever shape that is. Um, Narcan sort of competitively fights with the opioid for the binding site. So Narcan kind of knocks the opioid off the bonding, the binding site. Um, and the idea here is, you know, if this is the receptor in your heart and the opioid basically suppresses your heart such that your heart stops, you know, you're, you're dead. Um, so Narcan basically fights the opioid off the binding site and it doesn't, it doesn't stop the high. It doesn't, it doesn't in any way help with, 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 with withdrawal. It just keeps you from dying. Um, and a lot of, you know, I read an article the other the other week about some restaurants who were training their waiters and waitresses on how to use Narcan. It's sort of like a, an EpiPen you can inject in someone um, because people are going in the bathroom and overdosing and they're walking in the bathroom and finding people who are overdosed on opioids so they know how to use Narcan um, just to, to keep them alive. Um, yeah, that's, that's how Narcan works. Um, so very last thing. So this is, you have to do this. You just, you have to do it. This is, I think this is from the University of Utah. Um, if, I have, if I had you in anatomy class, we've already looked at this. This is an, an, an interactive, the link obviously you have to go to the PowerPoint or the Google Slides to see the link. Um, it's called Mouse Party. It's, I mean, it's funny. It's not like, it's you know tragically funny, but basically you can take a mouse and you can click on it and you can nicotine, heroin, um, meth, different drugs, and it will, it will, the mouse will act out the symptoms. It's, it's a little funny. Um, but then it also tells you what's going on in the body. And actually, if you go to this link, there's other simulations too about drugs, which will show you how the drugs work. Um, take a few minutes, go to it. It's, you know, it's, it's meant to be kind of funny, but you also learn a lot from it. Okay. Thanks. See you later.